Welcome to our study. Here in Australia, it's 7.30 at night. It's already dark. It's the winter. Mind you, winter here in New South Wales is, is um, it's not that, not that chilly. Anyway, welcome to our study. And um, as always, please kindly generate the enlightened intention of bodhicitta. And we'll actually be looking um, at, <clears throat> in some depth at how we actually do that, practically speaking, today. So what we have here is a quintessential Mahayana peace instruction. So within this text, then, we are presently in the second sec section. And within the second section, we're in the third, and actually in the second part, we're in the third section. And this is then the path for beings of superior capacity. So we looked at the three kinds of individuals, which, excuse me, three kinds of individuals. The first are those who wish to have higher rebirth in samsara, quite simply to have it good. The second are those who realize the problem with samsara and the conditioning, uh, the cycle of, um, <clears throat> of samsaric existence who then wish to be free of samsara. And then now we're looking at the path for beings of superior capacity and those who actually can't bear that um, others also are stuck within this, this um, situation uh, of samsara. And so these are the, the bodhisattvas who then uh, intend really to establish all beings on a level of perfect enlightenment. So in here we have two, and many of you are familiar with these concepts, the two which are the bodhicitta of intention and the bodhicitta of application. Mönpa and, and Jukpa Senkye. So the first is the bodhicitta of intention, which is the evocation of supreme bodhicitta, actually the compassion uh, that um, really leads to bodhicitta, and then the bodhicitta of application, which then has two aspects, the relative bodhicitta and the um, absolute bodhicitta. And then we have some precepts, how to train in these. So with regards to the first, the bodhicitta of intention, it is then this uh, wish to bring all beings to the level of perfect enlightenment. So, in here, Mulcha Togma, he writes, If all the mothers who have loved me since beginningless time are suffering, what is the use of my own happiness? So with the aim of liberating limitless sentient beings, to set my mind on enlightenment is the practice of the Bodhisattva. So, the, um, the nature of reality is, of course, beyond any kind of notion of self, other, any kind of dualistic perception. And yet, what happens is that we mistake this nature. There's a, there's a basic mis, misunderstanding, a basic mistake. And that's where, even though the nature is perfect, we fail to recognize this nature. And we have two kinds of ignorance, what we call co-emergent ignorance, which is just being, um, you could say, distracted. Um, somewhat lost, and then out of that then comes all the concepts, which we then refer to as uh, conceptual ignorance or labeling ignorance. So once we have these two, we essentially have the, the ground of samsara, which is the notion of I and other. And on the basis of the five skandhas, then it gradually we build up a whole story. But <clears throat> as much as we then are caught in this cycle. And it's there where we then have the patterns of our kleshas and the patterns of karma. As much as this happens, these delusional perceptions, they're not real. And this is where at any given time we could wake up. These projections are empty of true uh, existence. Now, what is it that obscures us is this basic most fundamental delusion where we think self other 
this and that. And so the, the bodhicitta of intention is realizing that, first of all, this delusion and the basic construction of a self is non-existent. And then with that also to understand how sentient beings suffer within this condition. And that's then the compassion. So the, the bodhisattva that possesses bodhicitta really has these two, um, you could say, aspects of the awakened mind, this bodhicitta, which is understanding the irreality, the complete illusional nature of all of this, and yet completely caring for and empathizing with sentient beings that suffer this delusional projection. So we can sum it up as Kinsman just says, the bodhicitta of intention, of aspiration, has two aspects, compassion, which is directed towards beings, and wisdom, which is directed towards enlightenment. So seeing reality for what it is, enlightenment, and understanding those who do not see reality for what it is, and suffer as a consequence, this compassion. So then we have in the, the um, Abhisamaya Lamkara, the Nguntokyen, in which then Maitreya says, Bodhicitta is to aspire to enlightenment for the benefit of others. And also we have Shantideva who says, Bodhicitta is the wish to establish all beings at the level of enlightenment. So Kyansaramaja here says, the infinite number of beings who, in your successive lives, since time without beginning, have been your parents, have loved you and cared for you, to the point of being ready to give up their own lives for your sake. It would be heartless of you to forget their indescribable kindness and to ignore their suffering. And it would thus be heartless too to practice the Dharma for your own liberation, ignoring the bondage of others. As I'm reading this, I remember once in Dharamsala, then uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama was teaching and he was describing the, the sufferings of samsara. And I think there must have been about a thousand people or something there. But uh, describing the suffering of sentient beings, His Holiness began to weep. <laughs> and, and we all completely broke down in tears as well. One thing is that the Dalai Lama, without doing anything, has a lot of us sort of already choked up and in tears. But when he starts to then also weep himself it was it was um it was really extraordinary a thousand people who were basically all weeping but this is on the basis of understanding the suffering of sentient beings and really with this perspective that we're joining it this perspective with here is really understanding that they have all cared for us they've all uh, looked after us and yet not clearly understanding what leads to suffering what leads to happiness they inevitably just continue perpetuating their own suffering. So can we leave them behind? So engendering this bodhicitta we're talking about here, it has great benefit now in the future and for our world. It's something that benefits us. It's going to be paving the way for a happy existence, even though that's not even particularly our objective. And it's something that really is uh, lays the foundation for us benefiting the world at large. So we wish to establish beings on the path to freedom, this is how we wish to repay their kindness. We could, of course, make beings happy, and we should, and there's various ways, really, of serving beings. One is to give them what they want, protecting them from fear, but the greatest, the greatest thing we can do for others is to put them on the path to freedom. So we, we essentially dedicate ourselves to the cause of others. And this, because there are infinite beings, this has infinite benefit. So, when we're practicing the Buddhist path, if we're practicing the Mahayana, if we aim for complete enlightenment, if it has bodhicitta, yes, this is what will bring us the Mahayana goal of perfect enlightenment. Otherwise, very likely, then we get that we get stuck. This stagnates. So, and this is sort of what, what whenever, whenever we study the Dharma, there's these three uh, aspects. They're referred to in Tibetan as the Dhamma Sum, which literally means the three holy uh, aspects of how we engage with our activities. Also sometimes translated as three excellences, uh, sometimes uh, translated as 
three supreme methods. If you look in words of my perfect teacher, that's what the Padmakara group, they translate this as. Most other places, three excellences. And that is, we prepare with bodhicitta. We have the main practice free from reference points, and we conclude with dedication. Now, what that means is, and this is so important because of va the value of our actions, of course, on the surface, yes, they have an impact. But, you know, in the Buddhism, we say the exact we say the exact opposite of we sometimes say in in, in the modern world where um, well it's an old saying but we say the, the the road to hell is paved with good intention <laughs> the buddhists would say the exact opposite the the road to heaven is paved with good intention so yes maybe sometimes our actions they go south in terms of uh, not achieving what we intended but if our motivation was good this has a lot of value, and that's really what determines uh, the what we could call karmic impact. So that's where if we check our motivation before we do something, and we have a good intention, we needn't hesitate too much. Of course, we should inform ourselves. We shouldn't just be completely clueless. But the bottom line is we, we needn't worry too much if we really have good intention. And when we have this bodhicitta intention, there is really infinite benefit. We have this intention to do something good, even the small thing for all sentient beings. It really has infinite benefit. The main practice is free from reference point is while we're at it. It's like we sometimes talk about process. Then we just go from A to B without evaluating. We just do it. And the implication here is that the main practice as we're doing it, having prepared for bodhicitta, is that it's without any reference point, ideally without any dualistic fixation, but in the absence of that, simply not being distracted. So just as, for example, when we are meditating, we have this intention to begin with, and then we meditate without going back and judging how good is our meditation uh, and so forth. And then at the end, we conclude. We think we just whatever good there was in this, we give it away. The best, of course, is when we do something valuable that we don't have any reference points, such as subject, object, and action. But that's not that easy. And that's where second best is to just think whatever good there is in this, I give it away to others. So that's as long as we are caught in this dualistic experience, then we, we, um, there's a lot of value where, when we apply these three excellences. So, preparation with bodhicitta ensures the success of our practice in the sense that it's done on a solid ground, particularly when we're meditating or studying the Dharma. It's not tinged or tainted by some agenda of self-aggrandizement or some commercial intention or whatever. It's simply just having bodhicitta is where we just purely wish to benefit others. Not attaching value to the threefold constructions of subject, object, and action aligns our practice with limitless reality. So if we can do that, then we are already completely uh, in, in the tune with the reality of things. Ken just says, the attitude of a bodhi bodhisattva must be extremely vast, constantly keeping in mind the infinity of beings and the wish to establish them all in Buddhahood. If your mind is vast, the power of your prayers is unlimited too. If your mind is narrow and rigid, your accumulation of merit and the purification of your obscurations will also be very limited. So us, keeping in mind the, the cause of all sentient beings, we're actually free from the burden of our narrowness and the um, accumulations of merit, the purifications of obscurations, then these happen naturally. Whereas if we continue to perpetuate our narrow, rigid thinking, then uh, it will be very little merit, very little obscurations. But this is of course not easy. In the modern world, there's very often a sort of a sense that it's normal to you know, look out for yourself and all of that. And this is a tricky point because we're not, a, we're not talking about people becoming martyrs and thinking of others and not thinking about themselves. There's nothing unhealthy psychologically in this. It's really just greatness of mind. There's, there's something very joyous about this. It's a lot simpler than we think. Sometimes 
there's a lot of discussion around compassion for oneself and so on. That implicitly takes place here. So there's never ever a question of suppressing one's, you could say, natural, um, you say, needs. This is what fulfills our needs more than anything. But it's also important that we're not just stuck on the theory around this and we actually practice it, but it's in the practice that we discover this freedom, this vastness. So with dedication, the benefit will never be lost, like a drop of water in the ocean. So if we have a drop of water on our finger, then it very quickly evaporates. If we put the drop in the ocean, doesn't evaporate. So that's where when we do something good and we just say, aha, that I was really quite a good boy there, then that kind of benefit and high and possible good merit that my or good karma that might come from that, that doesn't last that long. Whereas if it's something that we dedicate to others, there's we, we're not caught by the, you know, there's nothing that can actually, can't, there's nothing that exhausts in that. So we would say infinite prayers, meaning prayers that are intending to embrace all sentient beings as vast as the sky has infinite benefit. So I think this is from Shantideva. Um, it says, wherever the sky ends, there ends the number of beings. Wherever beings, destinies and emotions end, only there ends my prayers. Homework, look up at the sky and just think, where does it end? <laughs> do it you probably haven't done it since you were a kid and when you were a kid and you said dad mom where does the sky end you know you they were probably saying well you know that's you know we we're basically we were basically probably told that nature is wondrous and so on and you know whatever we might have been told we might not have done it recently you know, life just might have caught up, but it's good to sometimes look up and think, where does it all, where does the sky end? And that's where the number of beings ends. And that is also, it's almost like a one big gigantic statement that talks about the ungraspability of phenomena. The same applies if we look inside to phenomena, also there we won't find anything. So we have appearance, but yet there's nothing that can be grasped about it. And just looking up at the sky almost is, sort of spells out the message. So these three supreme points, preparation with bodhicitta, the main practice without reference point, and dedication, concluding with dedication, these three supreme points include the practice and attitude of the Mahayana. Until perfect realization, we need such uh, the skillful means of such an attitude. So Rinpoche says, the three supreme points include the whole practice and attitude of the Mahayana. This is why Mahayana teachers expound them over and over again. But just hearing them explained is not enough. You must assimilate and integrate them into your being. Day after day, check whether you are really acting in accord with them. If not, feel regret and try to correct yourself. Do not allow your mind to become distracted and merely follow its inclinations. So habitually our mind, sure will have all sorts of impulses. But what we're doing here really is integrating this vast vision. And we need to check ourselves that that is happening. And it's not difficult. It's not difficult to correct ourselves. It's just being mindful and being aware, just being sensitive. And there's nothing about the Mahayana teachings that's not to like. It's just about us remembering it. So, when it comes to this bodhicitta of intention that we're looking at right now, it can also be described with four immeasurables. This is sometimes referred to as the four um, Brahma Viharas, um, but in the Mahayana, actually, we don't say four Brahma Viharas um, because, of course, these are great. You could say Brahma Viharas means the abode of Brahma. These are great uh, sentiments. These are kindness that wishes beings be happy, compassion that wishes beings be free from suffering, joy that sympathizes when beings are happy, equanimity that wishes um, happiness for equally for all beings. This is These are great thoughts, but where it becomes immeasurable, again, is where it's applied to all sentient beings, the infinitude of sentient life. 
Kenzo Rinpoche says, just as you yourself wish to be happy, so too you should wish the same for others. Just as you yourself wish to be free from suffering, so too you should wish the same for all beings. May all beings be happy, free from suffering, and the cause of suffering. May they reach perfect happiness, remain in it, and live in equanimity. May they, remain, may they maintain love for all others without discrimination. This wish is called the bodhicitta. So, again, this noble, this noble um, intention that is infused with these four immeasurables, we should apply it as best we can without the fixation on subject, object, and action. This is what's so wonderful about a, a genuine sage is that the sage isn't sort of, uh, in, how do you say, impressed with him or herself in terms of being wonderful. The sage doesn't think, hey, uh, you, uh, look how wonderful I am and look how, how generous I am. I'm looking after you, you know, with this or that. Here's five dollars or, you know, here's me in front of, like, if we go and we see His Holiness the Dalai Lama, there the Dalai Lama is sitting in front of 5,000 people who all adore him. Now, if the, if the Dalai Lama actually were to have a moment of thought thinking, gosh, isn't it nice that everybody loves me? And what an amazing teaching I'm, I'm giving. And I'm actually very witty. And uh, I'm very compassionate. I'm the Dalai Lama. See, if the Dalai Lama had those thoughts, that wouldn't actually be the Dalai Lama. What is why we venerate the Buddha, the Dalai Lama, is because of the absence of this. This is what defines a sentient being, and the absence of this is what defines a sage. So subject, object, and action, well, it's something that runs very deep, and we would say it takes a very long time to eliminate that. We can look at ourselves, and even if we might be wonderful, uh, kind people, we still might have this subtle thought when we're kind to others, like, hmm, you know, we feel a little bit good about it. So this is what takes a long time to eliminate, but we aspire to that. We should never think, oh, I, I still have this dualistic fixation of subject, object, and action. Hence, I might as well give up on the bodhisattva path. I clearly can't do it. We should never think like that. It's, it's, it's inch by inch, millimeter by millimeter, that we gradually eliminate that. So, so there, as long as we still have that duality, it's difficult to benefit others. So it's only really when we ha are free from that that we begin to have a great um, ability to benefit sentient beings. Ken Zermatter says, the bodhicitta will grow effortlessly if you have this pure attitude of mind. A good mind has a natural intrinsic power to benefit others. Whatever merit arises from this vast attitude, instead of feeling that you own it, dedicated to all beings as infinite as space is vast. Stay free from any grasping at the reality of subject, object, and action, and the day will come when your body and speech will become, become the servants of your mind, and everything you do will spontaneously benefit others. With bodhicitta, we eliminate the very cause of suffering. We get right down to where the suffering originates, which is this delusional clinging to a self. And when we arouse this bodhicitta, thinking, I wish all beings be free of suffering. I wish all beings be uh, entirely free and liberated, established at the level of omniscience. This thought has such immense value, such immense merit. And we could distinguish between what we call good karma and merit, saying good karma is what might give us what we want, but merit really is what gives us what we need. So sometimes it could actually be our merit that things go wrong, so that we our mind comes to the Dharma, is brought to the Dharma. So, so merit is incredibly important. And so this arousing bodhicitta is really that what accomplishes that. Kinsharmaja says, if bodhicitta has not yet arisen in you, pray that it will arise. And if it has arisen, pray that it will increase. If the merit of arising bodhicitta were to take, a phys take physical form, not even the whole of space would be vast enough to contain it. So we have this chant that we often cite, may bodhicitta 
precious and sublime arise where it has not yet come to be and where it has arisen may it never fail but grow and flourish ever more and more this is in fact um this in fact is this kind of prayer that Rinpoche is talking about so then the bodhicitta of application let's see if there's a question here recently i heard several short talks by rubina curtain the nun in each one of them she was talking about how important it is to remember our own good qualities but it sounds like a fine line given that what you just beautifully reflected upon about his holiness well yes well rubina curtain is certainly right and it is so important that we should uh, appreciate ourselves what we have in our culture is sometimes this notion of the martyr somebody who is selfless yet underneath they're actually still there's almost some sort of a passive aggressive resentment here i'm being very nice um, um but i'm still not good enough and there's sort of some sort of like anger at ourselves the, this this is this is where we might we might actually think that to begin to think of others might be to overlook ourselves but the thing is when we begin to just effectively not theoretically but when we effectively begin to soften through the practice of meditation through the practice of of contemplating the suffering of others and sentient beings we we become soft and very gentle persons both with regards to ourselves and others it can't really go wrong but of course sometimes the language around this could sound very kind of self-effacing in a negative sense so that's why it's very important when we present this notion of compassion and so on that we're not saying something that could prompt people to fall into this kind of um, self-deprecation or low self-esteem and so forth so yes good all right so now we're going to look at the bodhicitta of application so that's where we have meditation or teachings on relative bodhicitta and absolute bodhicitta so the first within relative bodhicitta we have the practice of exchanging oneself and others and then the post meditation practice of using unfavorable circumstances on the path many of you will be familiar with these themes from teachings on lojong and the first one the meditation practice of exchanging oneself and others is really uh, this, this practice that we call tonglen simply giving happiness taking suffering so this is then the meditation practice of exchanging oneself and others all suffering without exception arises from desiring happiness for, for oneself while perfect buddhahood is born from the thought of benefiting others therefore to really exchange my own happiness for the suffering of others is the practice of the bodhisattva and again this shouldn't be misinterpreted in in a sort of an unhealthy and psychologically unhealthy way this comes from something extremely beautiful and this beauty is something that's innate to us so it's not about us all of a sudden thinking i should be in a way that i'm not it's really beginning to identify we have the laboratory of our own mind and in there we can begin to identify something that naturally is selfless naturally loving naturally caring and this this is really where happiness originates so there's never any kind of you know the problem very often with some of these teachings is they get take, taken in a behaviorist way like we should behave in a particular way i should think like this or i should speak like that it's all about the heart it's all about just be, beginning to hone in on something very beautiful that is naturally part of us and is naturally free from the uh, delusion of um, of our self centering but we need to identify where it is that suffering comes from and where it is that enlightenment comes from so the what we're doing here is reversing the logic that drives suffering namely me you know before others we're going to say others before ourselves but again it's so important that we don't get confused about this it comes from a very beautiful natural place not something about imposing some some self deprecation or anything so the cause of suffering our focus on ourselves is addressed through the practice of addressing of exchanging self and others it is to think we give our own happiness and takes others suffering 
So the cause of suffering is this self-fixation, which again, in which is where sentient beings are ignorant. The natural ground of the being of all uh, the, of the being that's common. This the natural ground of all sentient beings is free from this self, this dualistic fixation, and it's on the basis of this insecurity that then drives this drama around me versus other and prioritizing me that then we perpetuate a cycle of suffering. So this is where we reverse this. Now, if for some reason you think that this sounds very, uh, this sounds wrong or something, um, again, this is not about self-deprecation, but and it's very beautifully explained by, by some of the, the great teachers, particularly Chirgam Chompa speaks about this very well. Also, Pema Chodron, even though I haven't read much of her, her teachings, I know that she's very skillful in being sensitive to the, the, the thoughts that really are trending within our culture. And one of the thoughts that are trending in our culture is really that, to, uh, that it's very important that we first acknowledge and look after ourselves and so on. So that's where sometimes there's a perceived collision. But someone like Trungpa Rinpoche and Pema Chodron, they're very good in addressing this kind of, you could say, uh, where things get lost in translation. So Ken Rinpoche says, when you can actually take other people's suffering upon yourself, rejoice that you have fulfilled your aims. Never think that they did not deserve so much help, but that you have now done quite enough for them. So this comes from this very uh, resilient, open and uh, soft place that really cares genuinely for others and where we're always just hungry and longing to be able to do more for others. So we should cultivate this, vi this wish through actual vivid meditation on our mother's suffering. So that's where for us to really begin to sympathize. Again, this is not about perpetuating some selflessness that is artificial, but for us to really have that genuine incentive, we meditate on the suffering of, of others uh, through thinking of our mother, some or somebody we deeply love, deeply respect, going through suffering. And then we feel terrible about how they are suffering. So that's where we begin to cultivate this wish of helping others. And what we do with this, this practice effectively is that we inhale, we take other suffering, we exhale, we give our own happiness. And we hear, and this is Ken Zermudja talking from a place of great resilience and great trust in the students. He says, begin with persons who have caused us grief. So when we have persons who have really annoyed us, we should practice this uh, practice of Tonglen giving and taking uh, with such people. So this, if we can't do that, then begin with somebody who we genuinely care about. And we could even begin with our own mother, imagining our own mother suffering. But the bottom line really is that this is doable. And we could very well begin with someone that we continually generate a narrative about about how we don't like them, how they've done this to us, how it's unfair, unjust, etc. We could begin to just, you could say, uh, dismantle, pour some acid over this narrative and see it begin to crumble. And this we can do if we um, begin to apply the meditation of Tonglen to pe persons that have caused us grief. Then eventually we extend this to all sentient beings and we really repeat this continually until it becomes an integral part of ourselves. Kinsarma just says, as you breathe in, consider that you take into yourself in the form of a dark mass all the sickness, obscurations and mental poisons your enemy may have had and that he is thereby completely relieved of all his or her afflictions. Think that his or her sufferings come to you as easily as mountain mist wafted away by the wind. As you take his suffering into you, you feel great joy and bliss mingle with the experience of emptiness. Do the same for the infinity of beings who are visualizing before you. Send them all your own happiness and take on their suffering. 
repeat this again and again until it becomes second nature to you. So this is something where we need to try it. If we just hear about it, we might not understand it, but once it's something we do, then it's something that deeply grows on us and it begins to affect our attitudes, our choices, our way of interacting with others. Shantideva says, like earth and the pervading elements, enduring the sky itself, uh, enduring as the sky itself endures, for boundless multitude of living beings, may I be their ground and sustenance. Ken Zermager says, the dealing with your negative emotions. If you allow the negative emotions to express themselves in the ordinary way, you cannot hope to progress on the path. So when we have anger and um, dislike and a strong, you could say, polarization between ourselves and others becomes very solid and heavy, then this is something that really helps. If we if we don't apply the antidote to these kind of negative emotions, there's no way really for us to, to progress on the path. Then we can be practicing Buddhists or say we're practicing Buddhists for decades without actually much really changing. So we practice exchanging self and others with our clashes, destructive emotions. So we simply take, take their clashes, their destructive emotions. The thing is, in reality, Again, if we look, if we look in ultimate truth, ultimate truth is what we see when we actually apply analysis. We could say conventionally, then things are in so many different ways. But if we examine, we find that phenomena don't have any intrinsic reality. And that's why we see these clashes that we're inhaling, they are empty. And also the one that recognizes the emptiness also is empty. So Ken Zermund says to meditate according to absolute truth. Arouse in yourself an overwhelming feel of, feeling of desire. Fuel it by adding the desires of all beings to make a great mountain of desire. Then look right into it. You will see that desire is nothing but thoughts. It appears in your mind, but, not, but does not itself have even the tiniest particle of independent existence. And when you turn the mind inward to look at it itself, you become aware that the mind too is without inherent existence in either past, present, or future. The nature of the mind is as insubstantial as the sky. So anytime that we look at any given phenomenon here, a mountain of desire of, self, of ourselves and all sentient beings, anytime that we look at it, we cannot find any reality to it. So that's where looking makes it not go away, but we see its absolute truth, its absolute nature. We see that it doesn't have any reality. It's when we don't look that thoughts have this incredible authority over us. But if we look, it's like, it's like, um, it's a bit like Gollum. You know, if you take Gollum out, out of the mountain and into the light, Gollum loses his strength. And if we allow these things just to fester in the dark, yeah, they have a power over us. But if we take them out, they have no power whatsoever. And this also same applies to the subject that's doing this analysis. Without love and compassion, practices such as Mahamudra and Sokchan are pointless. So it's important that we've actually worked with this, this ordinary mind that perpetuates its own habitual misery. Um, and we've worked with it, made friends with ourselves through the practice of meditation and particularly through the practice of Lojong and Tonglen practices and so on. When we have then a mind that is soft, less held by the rigid assumptions basic to our delusion, then we have much more confidence in the quality of the mind. And that's where introduction to the nature of the mind can take place. Otherwise, this thing we call nature of the mind, we might find it convenient, but it doesn't really hit the spot. It doesn't really get to the bottom of our insecurity. Ken Zermer just says, some people may have the idea that these teachings on compassion and exchanging self and others are part of the gradual teachings of the sutras and are not nearly as effective as the more advanced 
direct path of the great perfection or the great seal. Only if you have developed the love and compassion of relative bodhicitta can absolute bodhicitta, the very essence of the great perfection and the great seal ever take birth in your being. So we need to have processed the mind, softened it before these teachings really um, can have the intended intention. Intended intention? <laughs> have the intended effect, yeah. When Pema speaks and dedicates, she always includes ourselves along with others and having happiness and the causes of happiness. She is really skillful in bring, at bringing Maitri into the conversation of Tonglen. They're not separate practices. Yes, exactly. That's, that's what I was saying before. Pema here meaning Pema children. So yes, Pema children, Shigam Trungpa and so on. Very skillful at addressing really sort of the, the ideas, the trending ideas of, around these issues. So bodhicitta of application can be seen in terms of a gradual development. First, equating oneself and others, which is where we begin to understand how others and we, we're equal in wanting happiness. Second, exchanging oneself and others, where we practice this giving our, our uh, happiness and taking others suffering and finally cherishing others more than oneself and this is where we see in the life of the, pre the Buddha's previous lives but even in recent time sages who just have no concern about themselves and are more than happy to completely uh, offer or sacrifice themselves I always think this example of somebody called Dola Jigme Kelsang who was present when there was a thief in China. He was traveling in China and there was a thief that was about to be executed. And he managed to convince. He couldn't bear that this man was going to be executed. And so he just convinced the, the people there that in fact it wasn't this man, it was him who was the culprit. And the man, the other man went free and Dola Jigmakelsam was executed in his place. But that's where he couldn't bear seeing this other person. Um, suffering. Chantideva in the way of the Bodhisattva says, all the joy the world contains has come through wishing happiness for others. All the misery the world contains has come through wanting pleasure for oneself. Is there need for lengthy explanations? Childish beings look out for themselves while Buddhas labor for the good of others. See the difference that divides them. So this is where we can see the difference between the sage and the ordinary person. The ordinary person suffering and the sage free and happy. So there's not a need for a lot of theorizing here. There's not really a need for sort of lengthy discussions of various kinds. We get it. And of course, there might be sort of all sorts of uh, sort of hesitation around it. But in our heart of hearts, we know exactly this is what it is. And it comes from this very, very beautiful space that we're describing here. So, as all the signs of the Buddha's perfection comes from wishing others everlasting bliss and happiness, everything that the Buddha really is is founded on this wish. Compassion for others is the most supreme offering to the Buddha. So we might we might think that we're making great offerings. We you know we might even sort of be preparing offerings, and then somebody comes along. Let's say somebody's making a perfect, beautiful offering and somebody else comes along with a really sort of poor offering. And there might be somebody who says, get away, you. I'm making perfect offerings here. <laughs> and of course, that completely defeats the purpose. The, what really is the perfect offering to the Buddhas is caring for others. So even if we might be offering an incredible, spectacular offering and somebody comes along and says, I'd like to offer, you know, one lollipop or whatever, then, then to be kind to them is much more important than all these other offerings. Caring for others, that's what really the Buddhas, uh, that really makes them happy. The biggest offering we could make to the Buddhas is being kind to other people. <clears throat> no disparaging words. Kinsherman just says, to have overflowing love and unbearable compassion for all beings, therefore, is the best way to fulfill the wishes of all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. As a beginner, you may not be able to help beings outwardly very much, 
but you should meditate constantly on love and compassion until your whole being is imbued with these two qualities, love and compassion. So now we're looking at, they're still in, in the, the bodhicitta of application, we're still in relative bodhicitta, and then we've looked at the meditation practice of exchanging self and others, and now the post-meditation practice of using unfavorable circumstances on the path. So, here there's four things that you do not want to happen. There's two things that are difficult to bear. And we have how to use deprivation and prosperity on the path and how to use hatred and desire on the path. So the four things that you do not want to happen is essentially what we call the, the uh, well, they're part of the eight worldly dharmas, but, but um, it's the things that we worry about, fear namely loss, suffering, disgrace, and disparagement. Yeah, we'd like to hear, we'd like to have gain, we'd like to have pleasure, we'd like to have a sweet reputation, we'd like to be praised. And so we, we come across the opposite. And this is where we actually train. We train in having these unfavorable circumstances is seen as an opportunity. When that happens, we go, yay. This is helpful. We'll see there's a quote from Paul which is that kind of makes, makes the point. But anyway, how to use loss on the path. And here, Mulcher Togma says, if someone driven by great desire seizes all my wealth or induces all others to do so, to dedicate to him my body, possessions, and past, present, and future merit is the practice of a bodhisattva. So if it happens that somebody rids us of all our possessions, we come home and our entire home is empty, then we should feel very grateful. The Bodhisattva never har har harbors ill will. This we might think is extreme, but actually this is the place of great happiness. If you wonder why Bodhisattva is happy, well, this is it. And as long as we still have attachments to our possessions, well, we might be have something we could call spirituality or something that sort of is, of course, we have all sorts of qualities, but we're still just stuck in this place that we, that, that drives suffering. So <clears throat> this is where we must begin to understand really what the nature of reality really is about and what the, the, um, the mind frame of the body, what really it is that makes the mind frame of the bodhisattva so extraordinary. So a bodhisattva never harb harbors ill will. Somebody steals from the bodhisattva, the bodhisattva isn't upset. The bodhisattva might need to do something about it for one reason or another, but there's actually never a moment of upset. So even if somebody tries to steal something from a bodhisattva, then then. Bodhisattva, just knowing this is not good for the other person to actually do that might prevent it. But there's never a moment where the Bodhisattva is actually deeply uh, uncaring about the other. So it's really good to hear about the Bodhisattva. And while we might not be there yet, we can aspire to that. So the Bodhisattva then practices accepting harm with compassion. Now doing that purifies negative karma frees us from anger and stimulates our positive qualities in that if somebody were to steal something from us, well, this isn't really just a result of us having stolen from them or done some action that really prompted this. So actually practicing compassion, then without retaliating, it purifies this negative situation. It frees us from all the harm that would come from anger. And, as, and when, we are, when we are suffering from anger, then it really propels more suffering rather here than being gaining the confidence by not being moved by anger this is something that increases our confidence and positive qualities then how to use suffering on the path so we looked at loss now how to use suffering on the path if if in return for not the slightest wrong of mine, someone were to cut off even my head, through the power of compassion, 
To take all his negative actions upon myself is the practice of a bodhisattva. Again, we might say this is extreme, but we would never have a moment when we talk about the bodhisattva where the bodhisattva says, okay, this is enough. <laughs> that's, that's, that's still then, there might be a great bodhisattva, but then, you know, somebody tries to cut off the bodhisattva's head and they say, no, 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 that's enough. Well, that's fair enough, but, but it's really in the nth degree then, the practice of the bodhisattva is this complete ease. There's never ever anything that will throw the bodhisattva. So this is where, this is what we aspire to. It's no question here that we're supposed to offer our head, right? But <laughs> it's just to understand the greatness of this bodhicitta. So we see the logic of cultivating compassion for our enemy. We understand what has happened in the past due to the karmic situation. We understand that our anger is going to what really would throw us into a miserable experience. And the value of cultivating compassion, where we're actually grateful towards the person that facilitates us um, generating patience, generating compassion. So there's every reason to have compassion for our enemy. And not only the enemy benefits us in this way, but the enemy probably will suffer as a consequence. If someone were to, to uh, harm us, then we actually are benefited through this being an opportunity for us cultivating compassion. But the, the person, the perpetrator, they actually are going to suffer as a result. And so there's even more. We should have both gratitude and compassion for such a person. So that's where we pray. May we take their result in suffering. We see that all the suffering comes from this self-cherishing, this delusion. We see that in reality is no self. And we, as practitioners, we then begin to familiarize ourselves in the sense that this is what we continually cultivate. This would be the most meaningful thing we could ever do with this human life. How to use disgrace on the path? So we we'd really like to be praised we love being praised but the opposite might take place so Ngunsha Togme says even if someone says all sorts of derogatory things about me and proclaims them throughout the universe in return out of loving kindness to extol that person's qualities is the practice of a bodhisattva so we again we realize somebody this slandering us is a result of causes. We understand that it doesn't just come about like that, but there's a karmic, you could say, situation. We've done something before. And through us going through this, we actually are exhausting, we're purifying the cause. So this attitude is something that we continually integrate in our path. This vastness of mind we integrate uh, in our um, meditation. It's where our meditation is not about achieving some sort of spiritual comfort zone, but really is working with these difficult circumstances. And if we look for actual examples then in the past, masters have always responded to disgrace with kindness. There's a very sweet story about um, Langri Tangwa, who uh, there was a couple there due to particular circumstances. They um, they came with their child. Uh, actually, the, the mother came with the child to Lauri Tangwa and then said, uh, look, um, look what you've done here. This is your child. Take him. <laughs> and anyway, you can read the story in, in the book, right? But it says, you know, she says, you know, this is your child. Here, take him. So Lauri Tangwa took the kid and found a nice woman who would, you know, look after the kid. And then a few years later, then the, 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 the parents there came back and says, okay, um, you know, this is why we had to do this. So please, we'd like to take our kid back. And Lano Chamba said, 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 all right. And um, don't ask me how it, how it all panned out with regards to the surrogate mother. I'm not sh sure about that situation. Could have become compl complicated. But the bottom line is that the, the point here is that Lano Chamba, being a monk and being accused of having fathered a child, would have been seen as being disgraceful. And that's where Lauri Tango just remained with complete equanimity around that and really just looked after, made sure that the kid was okay. So fame and notoriety, 
are both no more than an empty echo. The Bodhisattva is not concerned about having a good reputation or not having a good reputation. The Bodhisattva is just concerned about benefiting others. So how to use disparagement on the path? So even in the midst of a large gathering, someone exposes my hidden faults with insulting language. To bow to him respectfully, regarding him as a spiritual friend is the practice of a bodhisattva. So four principles to abide by in relation to others' perceived aggressions. So if somebody abuses you, you do not abuse them in return. If somebody gets angry with you, you do not get angry with him in return. If somebody exposes your hidden faults, do not expose his in return. If somebody strikes you, do not strike back. At this point, I think you probably get the logic here. We understand there's a karmic situation. We understand how the pleasure of anger is not going to help us. And we should, in fact, be grateful when this situation happens. So that's where we appreciate how this is helping us. And while the other one is, in fact, benefiting us, to strike back would be completely inappropriate. And rather, instead, we should recognize the suffering the other one is going to go through. And for that reason, really embrace them with compassion. There's in the chapter on, on patience, Shantideva, um, or in the commentary at least to Shantideva's, uh, probably it's in the root text as well, but anyway, if somebody hits, hits us with a stick, we don't get angry at the stick. We get angry at the one behind the stick. Somebody hits us on the head with a baseball bat. We don't start you know, getting angry at the baseball bat. We get angry at the one who drove the baseball bat, who used it. And similarly also, if we look at what it is that drives the uh, abuse that others might heap on us, it's not, the, it's not the person as such. It's the ignorance behind. It's the, the initial condition where this person is actually innocent. He or she is driven by a fundamental confusion that constructs self and other. And on the basis of the, the you could say, the painful interaction with the other, this person is, is held by this condition of aggression. So we understand what is behind, not the person's uh, body, speech, or mind, but the ignorance that's behind it. So. The thing is, we need to recognize that murders, wars, and all conflict begins with angry thoughts. We are in no way helped by being angry. Insults and harm give us a chance to check our bodhicitta. We should be very helpful, ha happy if somebody, you know, they uh, insults us, harms us, etc. In ultimate truth, distinctions such as benefit harm are seen to be empty. So ultimately, there is no perpetrator. There is no recipient of the harm. There is no actual action. And this, is, this also has to do with us looking properly. And that's where the Rishi, the one who sees properly, is not held by these, these distinctions of someone benefited or harmed. Ken Sermajar says, there should be no insult or humi humiliation that is too great for you to bear. If you were ever to feel it was justifiable to respond vindictively, the exchange of bitter words and recriminations would ensue, that would ensue would be bound to inflame and escalate the anger on both sides. This is how people start to fight and kill each other. Murders and wars all begin with just one angry thought. So this is obviously important. And the wonderful thing about this, this is not some bland statement. This is very radical very provocative. It would be very odd if in reading this, we don't have some reaction that says, no, I can't do this. And that's why this is interesting. This is something that's worth looking into. And we can probably acknowledge that we definitely respect people who would have these qualities. We would respect such great courageous individuals. And we ourselves have probably at times been very large-minded with regards to others and it has worked so much better than when we responded vindictively. Ken, uh, sorry, the great Jigma Lingpa said, ill treatment by opponents is a catalyst for your meditation. 
Insulting reproaches you don't deserve spur your practice onward. Those who do you harm are teachers, challenging your attachment and aversion. How could you ever repay their kindness? So we'll see there's also a quote from Paltrimji that said something to this effect. But in fact, it is these difficult situations that, that spur us on really on the path. Of course, reacting is not going to be helpful, but once we begin to understand the logic of what is being said here, then when we find ourselves in difficult situations, we go, ah, didn't I hear something about this? <laughs> and that's where it's kind of like, okay, I'm going to try this out. <laughs> and that's where actually trying this out is then where it actually spurs our practice onwards. There's nothing not to like about it. We become kinder, happier persons. So those who do our, us harm are teachers. We, at the end, will respond, we'll respond um, thinking, really, how could I ever repay their kindness? Actually, I'll tell the story about Kanjurumaja. There's actually, I think, I think there's a few places in Sydney, maybe, and somewhere else. Kanjurumaja, there's a movie called Return to Gandhi Road. If you have the chance, see it. And in there, there's a great Lama that's referred to a lot, Kanjurumaja. Kanjurumaja, when he was young, he had a very abusive stepdad. And the stepdad actually, during the winter, this is in Eastern Tibet. Winters in Tibet are beyond anything we <laughs> are used to. And the stepdad would, would chuck the child outside. And it was through this, thanks to Kanjurumaja's previous training in previous lives, he actually spontaneously just found out, oh, holding his breath while he was out there in the cold, suddenly the the uh, tumo the tumo uh, fire blazed and he actually was able to spend very the nights out in the in the cold very comfortably and so and the, the, his stepdad did other horrific things and each time it really resulted in country with discovering new ways of handling extraordinarily difficult situations and he ended up being very grateful to his stepdad without the stepdad he wouldn't have discovered these qualities at least not in that way so at the end of it, when when the stepdad was old, Kanjurimacha, who traveled around, he took him with him everywhere and, and, and looked after him. <laughs> so now we're going to look at the two things that are diff difficult to bear. Um, being wronged in turn, return for kindness and humiliation. So being the path, being how to use the path, being wronged in return for kindness. So we're nice to somebody and yet they abuse us and as a result. Nusha Tokma says, even if, even if one I've love, lovingly cared for, like my own child, regards me as an enemy, to love him even more as a mother loves a sick, sick child is the practice of a bodhisattva. So the bodhisattva understands what's afflicting a, a uh, sentient beings. So when sentient beings behave in a ridiculously aggressive, unkind way, the bodhisattva is never, never, is never doesn't move the bodhisattva. The bodhisattva is, has this great magnanimity, just like if a, a mother is looking after a sick child. When the sick child sort of in, maybe in, uh, you can say fever, in the sort of fever, hallucination begins to sort of hit the mom or whatever the, the, the mom, mom doesn't give up the mom loves the child even more Ken Rimmage talks about if a child bites the mom uh, the nipple when they're nourishing and the, the child bites the mom on the nipple this doesn't make the, the mom give up on the child so on the very contrary so that's where the bodhisattva never ever um, gives with um, uh, with with wishing something in return, so the bodhisattva cares for others without without ever hoping that there might be some sort of uh, might be that it might be an investment. So similarly, we should aspire with that we should love others. Um, we should love someone uh, that returns benefit with harm. Sorry. Yeah, this is where um, when we similarly when we are abused with by others we should love somebody like that we've been looked after some we've looked after somebody um 
maybe if we've sort of we've uh, we've taken in somebody and we look after them for a long time maybe traveler comes to us and we look after them for a long time then we go and visit them where they live and they're completely rude and abusive so that's where we should love someone like that again along the lines of the logic we've seen before someone who hurts us is a precious find so we also see this in the verses of mind training from langri tamba even if someone who we've we've um, looked after with hope to, that they will benefit turns around and abuses us uh, terribly we should look to them as as if they were a precious teacher so that is this is difficult to bear. Now, again, this is not something that we expect to be easy. And that's, again, why this is interesting. This is radical. We shouldn't be upset if we read this and thinking that's not normal. <laughs> of course, it's not normal, but that's also why we suffer. Here, we're engaging in something that is radical and really interesting. And this is the way out of suffering, ultimately. Otherwise, we're just going to do sort of a half-hearted job. So then how to use humiliation on the path? So that's another thing that's difficult to bear. Mucha Togma says, even if my peers or my inferior, even if my peers or my inferiors out of pride do all they can to debase me, to respectfully consider them like my teachers, on the crown of my head is the practice of a bodhisattva. So regardless of how people treat us, we should not be upset. We should see persons who insult us as our teacher. Kinsram just says, to remain humble while pat patiently bearing insults is a very effective way of countering your ingrained tendency to be interested only in your own happiness and pleasure. So somebody treats us badly, you should think, oh, this is really wonderful. This is, this is going to be, um, this is very helpful for my, this is very helpful for my pride. I'm very helpful for my, um, attachment to my own well-being. Again, please don't read anything unhealthy into this. Again, this is where it's, it, we have to let this sit and actually begin to experience what this means. So now we're looking at the uh, the um, again the third way in which we can use unfavorable circumstances on the path. So we use two things, we use deprivation and prosperity. So there's two ways, things might not go our way or things might go our way. So it says here, how to use deprivation on the path. Even when utterly destitute and constantly maligned by others, afflicted by terrible illness and prey to evil forces, to still draw upon myself the suffering and wrongdoings of all beings and not lose heart, is the practice of a bodhisattva. So we aspire that we may take on others' lack of merit, lack of wealth, lack of good health. May we take it on ourselves. So of course, we should possibly do that in reality, but we certainly, it might be difficult, right? So we begin just with the wish. At this point, we're not talking about behavior, remember? We're talking about this wish that just really has that infinite uh, caring. So um, we consider difficult situations are our spiritual teachers. Ah, oh, yeah, this is the quote I'm always thinking of from Paul Trevor, where he says, I don't like happiness, I like suffering. If I'm happy, the five poisons increase. If I suffer, my past bad karma is exhausted. There's a whole long um, a poem that's like eight verses or something like this along these lines yeah in there also he says i don't value high positions i like low ones if i am important my pride and jealousy increase if i am lowly i relax and my spiritual practice grows the lowest place is the seat of the saints of the past so this we very often would say that the the, the seat of the, the 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 seat of the bodhisattva the seat of enlightenment is the lowest seat and how Bodhi, uh, how great sages they would all, always take this the lowest seat so that's also why we would Tonsa Kinsarimaji often talks about how 
gurus are only real gurus when they don't want to be gurus. The people that you see on thrones and wearing, you know, brocade and hats, they only really deserve it when they don't want it. Our presumption when we have teachers that do wear great hats and have brocade and so on, our presumption is that they are there because they actually don't want it. And that is where we can sometimes come across um, scenarios with individuals who actually in, in, in Kathmandu, in, in, the, in Tamil, where the, where the hikers they go, then you can act there. There's, um, there are uh, tailors who actually, uh, you can actually buy some of these ceremonial hats. And of course, some tourists will buy them and they're kind of just funny and that's okay. But there's actually people who would buy some of these, you know, lotus hats and so on and sort of start wearing them and present themselves as, you know, great gurus or authorities on the whatever. And that's actually, this this is actually uh, what what we're talking about here. And that's where the real great teachers, um, they actually really don't care about this and they only do it for, you could say, communication. It could be helpful. Dilgu Kanserimbaji would sometimes be decked out with beautiful brocade attire. And he would do this exclusively because he really wanted to reach people. And in, the, in his role as a, perhaps a Vajrayana teacher, he might take on this role. But Rinpoche himself had no such desires. Rinpoche himself lived in a very simple little room um, in his house. And uh, wherever Rimsha went, he never had any wish for any kind of uh, sort of uh, uh, special treatment. Well, of course, he received it because, you know, everybody had such deep respect for him. But you could see he really didn't care about these things. And his lifestyle reflects this. He, he, he would spend a long time in retreat under very simple circumstances. Anyway, this... This is giving us some idea of what the Bodhisattva is like. And it says, though I may be famous and revered by many and as rich as the God of wealth himself, to see that the wealth and glory of the world are without essence and to be free of arrogance is the practice of a Bodhisattva. So we probably suspected that much, but it's important that we reflect that the glories of the world are insignificant and hollow. They don't last. They don't have any absolute value. Now, as much as we uh, could have aspirations to have all sorts of um, credentials, status, and so on in this world, um, it's actually through wanting it that we don't have it. Whereas the bodhisattvas who couldn't care less, they, they naturally just do their merit. They just could very easily take place. And that's also why bodhisattvas, if they aspire to be reborn um, as monarchs, uh, they are very easily, that will very easily uh, happen on the basis of their merit. They don't have this poverty. And that's where they aspire then to be born in, with a role in which they could help others. So we do see some great uh, leaders uh, among um, monarchs or what we call Dharma kings, Dharma rajas. So down through the history of Buddhism, great benefactors of the Buddha, King Trisan Detsen in Tibet, Sri Ralpa Chen and others uh, in recent time. What's his name again? In, um, in Dege, there was, a, there was a great king there. Sonsikens Rinpoche has been talking about him. Uh, I forget his name, something searing. Anyway, he was a Dharma king. So, Ken Rinpoche says, pray to be able to follow the example of the great bodhisattvas who because of their past generosity and accumulated merit were born as powerful monarchs with fabulous wealth, using their riches to help the poor and to alleviate famine and sickness. So such people exist. Then that's using prosperity on the path. So that's the third category. And then the fourth category of using unfortunate circumstances on the path then is uh, hatred and desire. So the first of these is then hatred. If one does not conquer one's own hatred, the more one fights outer enemies, the more they will increase. Therefore, 
with the armies of loving kindness and compassion to tame one's own mind is the practice of a bodhisattva. So with love and compassion, there are no outer enemies. We should never get angry, but rather be grateful to the object of hatred. Now, this thing of the enemy is really just, the, the, people are enemies on the basis of harming us, right? But others might see this and they wouldn't have experienced the same degree of frustration if we're being harmed, right? So it's not like there's an absolute. It's really just because of our attitude that this is, this is against me. So it's very relative to us. And the thing is, when we begin to respond to the other as being perceived solidly in a particular way, this anger that is directed outwards towards the other, it begins to become part of our, uh, our pattern of perception. One thing is that we might have a moment of anger, but when we give into it and we begin to actually follow it and begin to act it out, then it becomes more and more entrenched in our person and also in the way that we perceive the outer world. So this is the way that we essentially generate hell. And that's where there's not really any, any enemy out there, but there's an enemy in our mind if we react in this way, if we don't have patience. So that's where we should rather understand that the other party is acting out of ignorance and we should really just, as per what we saw above, have love and compassion. In the ultimate, at the end of the day, there are no real enemies out there. There might be persons who are acting in a particular way that goes against our wishes, but behind that person perpetuating this, there is no solid, real individual. It's just causes and conditions. And our perceptions are causes and conditions. And we actually have power to work with these causes and conditions in ourselves. We can't really change the outer, uh, the outer uh, circumstance. So, in fact, when we have these negative conditions, then we have an extraordinary opportunity. So we should be grateful to the object of hatred. Ken Zermich says, it is a crucial point of the teachings to become conscious that attachment, aversion, and ignorance are your oldest enemies. And that once you have overcome them, there are no further enemies in the world outside. The time will come when you see very clearly and precisely how this is so. If you do not understand this point and act carelessly, your emotions can get completely out of control. And then Rimuji quotes Geshe Potowa, one of the early Kadampa masters. If you see anyone as an enemy and think of others in terms of close and distance, you will not attain, in Bud you will not attain Buddhahood. So generate love and compassion, compassion impartially for all sentient beings as infinite in number as space is vast. So as long as we are still held by these projections, these are, these are going to obscure our attainment of awakening. How to use objects of desire on the path. Mnuchi Togme says, sense pleasures and desirable things are like salt water. The more one tastes them, the more one's thirst increases. To abandon promptly, all objects which arise at, arouse attachment is the practice of a bodhisattva. So as we probably suspected then, craving things and sometimes getting them is never going to satisfy us. The more we have, the more we want. We can, especially in the modern world actually, so often we are very, in, within the arts, within literature, within movies and so on, we're very skillful at portraying the neurotic patterns. We don't have a lot of, we don't have a lot of literature that really describes the movies that describe enlightenment, but we have an incredible wealth of actually describing rather miserable uh, stories about miserable individuals. And that's where one of these uh, themes that we very often come across is then the, the greedy individual, the rich, the greedy, and so on, that never ever is really truly satisfied or gratified, no matter how much they have. So that's the rather familiar theme. Thing is, we can do something about this. We are not caught. We couldn't say, "Oh, it's just human nature." Yeah, it's human nature on the, in the sense that this is what brings suffering to humans. But there is something we can do about it. So, 
we should recognize this we should cut our attachment but there's one thing where we should never be satisfied and that is studying the dharma practicing the dharma so kenzo image says be satisfied therefore with whatever you have by way of ordinary things but never with the dharma okay let's just see if there might be some questions um I oscillate between these teachings and last week's how to stay with bad company um, because it's also an opportunity to practice repaying kindness. Uh, how do we work with this contradiction? I'm not sure there is a contradiction. Um, let's see here. Uh, how to stay with bad company? Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah we should avoid bad company. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's because in the beginning, we might not be able to properly uh, handle the bad company. But the, we're talking here more about the, the wishes. So we might actually, for the time being, retreat from bad company, but it doesn't mean that we're ultimately abandoning these. So here we're, we're working, remember, we're working with, it's not about behavior. Again, this is very much about us simply, at this point, really just begin to shift just turn around, even just at the just beginning to go in that direction and beginning to really be genuinely patient, be genuinely caring about others. We don't need to seek seek out difficult circumstances. They they come quite naturally. Okay. So next time, please read then the verses 22 to 30, their their commentary. So this is still within the path of uh, beings of superior capacity. We're going to be looking at absolute bodhicitta, how that is applied in meditation and post-meditation. And then the third section uh, in our discussion of the path for beings of superior capacity, which is then precepts for the training, which are then the six transcendent perfections, the six parameters. Okay. Thank you very much for joining in this study. Oh, something missing here. <laughs> the dedication verse. Okay, I'll chant it for all of us. By this merit, may all attain, um, by this merit, may all attain omniscience, may it defeat the enemy wrongdoing. From the stormy waves of birth, old age, sickness and death, from the ocean of samsara, may all beings be free. May bodhicitta, precious and sublime, Arise where it has not yet come to be, and where it has arisen, may it never fail, but grow and flourish ever more and more. Thank you. Thank you.